now tuned into Thorough Black Talk with Tad, Keisha, and Ashe every Thursday, 8 to 10 p.m. Good evening, good evening, good evening, family. Welcome to another edition of Thorough Black Talk with your sister Keisha, your brother Tad, your brother Blacksmith, and your sister Marcia will be joining us shortly. Glad to be black with y'all for another week. We got a lot to discuss. A lot has been happening in the last few days. We got a lot to touch on. Hope y'all doing well. Hope y'all doing well. Share the program. Share the program. Make sure you like. Hit them thumbs up. And we hit them thumbs up. Let's get it popping. Brother Tad, you ready? He says yes. Brother Tad, Brother Tad, what's good? What's good? What's good? Gotta unmute yourself, brother. Oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. There we go. Peace to the family. Peace, Sister Keisha. How you feeling? Tired. I almost overslept, child. <laughs> <laughs> I know how that go. I know how that go. Man, yeah, I, I was trying to call in last week, but I was traveling and the signal just kept going in and out, in and out. So I, I guess it was that. just meant for me to... I figured as much. How was your trip? I saw some great pics you posted. How was your trip? Oh, man, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Oh, man, ain't nothing like family. You know, sometimes yeah. you go see a family and you don't even realize how much you needed that for your own peace of mind and mental health. And I got to see my grandmother. I ain't seen my grandmother in a year. You know, I don't think it's been that long. Yeah, yeah. During COVID, I haven't seen my grandmother in that long. But prior to that, you know, it was so long. I miss my grandmother so much. I'm glad she's still amongst us. Peace That's to Sister Farnessa. <laughs> Call me Pastor Tad. That's right. I'm going to speak the good word from the good book. Hallelujah. Holla back. You know? <laughs> but yeah, you know, I got the, I got the, um, see some childhood friends, you know, that I grew up with. I got to see my niece and her children. You know, it's just it's just a beautiful thing, you know. It's a beautiful thing when you're amongst family because we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle. You know, family is real important, but ain't nothing more important than spending time with them outside of funerals and in weddings and things like that, you know. So my trip was dope. My, my, my trip was super dope. Words can't even explain it. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I always say, Hey, Grandma. That's right, Nana. How you doing, Grandma? Word up. Shout out to Grandma. Word up. <laughs> Sister Keisha, I don't think I've ever been so happy in so long just to be in her presence, you know? Because, you know, as our elders age, ain't no telling how much longer we'll have them, you know? Fair. And, um, you know, a couple of months ago, was it? No, in fact, it was the last month. It was the end of February. My uncle passed away, you know? Oh, wow. So my grandmother that. has one child left. Mm. My aunt, my aunt in South Carolina, mm. you know, my grandmother had four children and three of them are gone. You know, I mean, grandma, you gotta, I live in everybody. You gotta, you gotta hold on to family while you can. Get those oh, yeah. jewels because, you know, it's not like sitting amongst the oldest and elders in your family and getting all that information and them jewels that they drop to you. You know what I mean? So that's always yeah. very important. Definitely. Definitely. So shout out to the family. We glad to be black with y'all. Sister Donna, Brother Calwood out in Birmingham, Alabama. I want to check in. Aunt Marie, Uncle Jesse Pizzo, Brownsville's finest in the building, in the building, in the building. Alabama crew, Sister Farnessa, what's good with you? Sister Joyce, Brother Monty, Suffolk County. You know, I always said Nassau County. You know they in Suffolk County. I'm telling you, <laughs> Suffolk County on the check in. Brother Pete, still back strong Island. Yes, yes, still strong Island. You know, people be trying to play on Long Island. You know, they be putting them out there with the Staten Island crew all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of their favorite got, artists uh, come out of out of these places. Well, the leaders enemy. of the new school, the public public enemy, EPMD. Uh, who else? So a few. Uh, De La Soul, if I'm not mistaken. Ooh, Ashanti, I think. 
think Ashanti's from yep. Long Island also. Long Island, yep. yep. Nah, we got we got a lot of a lot of dope artists out of Long Island. And those are just songs we can name off our head. I'm quite sure if we dig deeper, you know. Right. You know, people don't well, think about, you know, when they talk about New York City, they don't think about Long Island, Yonkers. They don't think about these places, right. but some of the greatest, as you said, have come from these uh, uh neighborhoods, Yonkers. You can't talk about Yonkers without talking about uh a DMX. You, you, you just can't. Right. And the locks. Or the locks. And Mary J. Blige. There you go. The queen of <laughs> hip hop, so. There you go. So you can't you can't leave those places out, family. So remember, it's more than just the five boroughs out here. You know, That's we right. rock together. We rock together. That's how we do. So, you know, speaking of good music, you know, Public Enemy was always one of my favorites back in the day. You know, once they get on, I don't know, it was just something about Public Enemy back in those days that really got you pumped and hyped. And wanted to learn more about yourself, want, wanted to learn more about the movement, brother Magnetic P said, Yeah, Rakim also. That's right, Rakim, that's a fact. There you go. You gotta look at it. I'm telling you, boy, the, the extraordinaire himself, Magnetic Tyson, gonna let us know what it is. You know, people don't know that you know, brother Peace is actually from Manchester, England. Okay. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. People don't know that. So you know, it is what it is. Uncle Jesse said, in the house. That's right, Uncle. In the house, in the house, in the <laughs> house. So we got to get into it tonight, family. We had um, a great weekend. Um, I'm trying to wait for Sister Marcia to get in here to talk about what we saw with the um, film fe at the film festival. First of all, they uh, showcased a lot of films, right? A lot of great short films. And um, from the ones that I saw, um, they were all very unique um something to see some were as short as maybe five minutes so you got to see a series of films that also that highlight um a lot of the things that we go through some of our, our history and even the political times that we live in so it was great to be at the queen's village um film festival at um chocolate at the chocolate loft in queens you know, I don't venture too much out to Queens, but when they had the film festival, I had to pull up. So I did. But um, it was a great time. I got to meet up with Baba Amin from the Uhuru Academy in South Carolina. All right. It was, Shout out to you, Baba Amin. Yes. Yeah, I saw know, that too. I thought that was dope. I said, wow, he made his trip to New York. Yep, just to see that film. And I don't know if you know Brother Tad, but he was also a consultant on the Messiah movie. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so it was. I learned that on your page, <laughs> looking at the video. Yep. So we got to talk to him and some other people while I was there. Um, so many people um was um happy to see that that film. It's about forty minutes long. It's a short. Um, with the hopes that as more attention that it gains and, you know, the more um, 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 money we could receive, we, uh, Brother Gerard was saying that he wants to try to make this out to a limited series. Um, it talks about, well, the film actually dealt with the trial of Marcus Messiah Garvey. And that's something that's not often talked about. It dealt with his relationship to um, his wife at the time, his relationship to people in the movement. Um, it highlighted some of the infiltrators. It highlighted um, the techniques that the prosecutor and, and, and J. Edgar Hoover or Gay Edgar Hoover, um, how he manipulated the witnesses um, in the trial. Um, you got to see the psychology of Marcus Messiah Garvey from a boy um, into a man. And, um, um, that was one thing that stood out to me, but, um, you know, follow Messiah, the movie on social media platforms so that you can get to see it at a film festival near you. Um, it's definitely, definitely something to see. Um, now I know brother Tad, I know you ain't get to see the film, but from the clips that you saw, um, what are your thoughts? You know, is there an excitement in you that you want to see the film? Because we got to build an excitement for it. You know, I don't remember the clips because I saw the clips a while ago before y'all went to see the movie. 
but just just to see us on the big screen is always important. Just to have our stories told. I'm always excited. I support all of it. Not the coonery and the foolery. Not the good times animation joint. I don't support that. But movies that talk about our freedom fighters, just to keep it fresh. Because I think if they were needed, now is more necessary than any time. Even within their lifetime. Because so much rhetoric, as I like to call it, is being spewed. Especially with social media. People can say and post anything and people will run with it as facts and people don't do their due diligence. And it's, it's, it's almost insulting to our intelligence because people try to have an intelligent conversation with no basis of, of information, no frame of reference, no resources. So it's just a whole feeling. I feel, I feel. And, and their scope is so limited. That is, yeah. Is. So we need these movies and I'm glad that they consulted Baba I mean, I'm quite sure they consulted other African-centered people who are serious-minded and do they do diligence in the research as opposed to just putting it out there. I saw a post not too long ago, Sister Keisha, that said uh, the whole Nat Turner story is fake. Nat Turner never existed. I'm like, yo, and, and, and comments like that, I don't jump on them and, and comment because they also said there's no there's no proof that Harriet Tubman was even real. Even though they have physical descendants still alive till this day, I've been to Harriet Tubman's grave. People told me that slavery wasn't real. I said, I went to Africa. I've been to the dungeons. You mean to tell me the white folks is that elaborate that they're gonna go to another continent to make up a lie to convince you for the future? Like, come on, man, stop it. Stop giving these people that much credit. But they have a following because they say the most outlandish thing that's so sensational that people are gonna tap in with them to see what else do they know. Like, is this true? Like, why would you even entertain that? But this is why these movies are so important and who puts them out? Because we can't expect Paramount or Warner Brothers or MGM to tell our story properly. It's only on us. In fact, I saw something earlier talking about you know, not just Black Wall Street, but all the communities we had and all the banks, insurance companies. And even that there was an oil well in one state that was owned by Black people. So all this stuff we keep talking about, we want, we've already had. And and when you, I don't know if you go through this, Sister Keisha, but when you have conversations with people, the level of ignorance, I, I don't want to call it stupidity sometimes because some people are stupid, but then some people earnestly don't know and they don't take the effort to look deeper. You know what I mean? So I'm like, come on, you. I'm, I'm giving you resources. That's why anytime we have a conversation on Thorough Black Talk, what do I do? I refer a book, I just pull one off the shelf to show you. I'm not pulling this out my coattail. This is real documented information. And though maybe you have never heard it before, doesn't mean it don't exist. But people are out the loop because they take other people's word for face value. That's why even when we talk, you give them references. We give references. Don't take what Tad and Keisha say. Don't believe us. Do the research. Do the research. Yep, because you don't want to be misconstrued on nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Um, always. I and remember, family, follow us on Instagram because I, we post a lot of historical information on our on our history, on our, um, excuse me, uh, uh, Instagram page um, for you guys to see. Sister so, Keisha, yes. I'm going to ask you a question real quick. I want to ask you a question real quick. Do you remember who Dr. Clark's teacher was? Could you, could you tell the people who his teacher was? Two that I know of is Arthur Schomburg mm -hmm. and, um, excuse me, Arthur Schomburg and, um, Drusilla Dundee. So I was, and a lot of people. I was thinking think Arthur Schomburg. Yes. I was thinking Arthur Schomburg. Right? Who was Arthur Schomburg? Puerto Rican brother out of Harlem, who is the founder of the Schomburg Library in Harlem, for those of you who don't know. I was having a conversation recently with someone and we were talking about Puerto Ricans calling them white. And I was explaining that not all Puerto Ricans are white. Facts. Some Puerto Ricans are black. Facts. And that was a, a debate. Dr. Ben. 
Dr. Ben. I mean, there's so many people who are Puerto Rican that are black, that are our teachers. But sometimes people, when the information is new to them, they resist it. And I'm only here to share information. I don't even like to call myself a teacher, but that's why I asked you, because we'll refer to Dr. Clark. In, in conversations and debates, but seldom do we talk about their teachers. Like when we talk about Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, who do we say her teacher was? Dr. Neely Fuller Jr. We have to go back to the source of the source when we start citing and quoting our source. Like Dr. Edwin Nichols, I believe, was the, the, the teacher for um, Dr. Joy DeGruy, who wrote Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. I think Dr. Edwin Robinson is the teacher of Brother Jabari and his wife. Brother Jabari Osazi and his wife. Like, we have so much brilliance within our community, and we like to narrow it down to one or two people. And this is why I see a collapse in the movement, and not just in the movement, but even within our own Black families, because we think our knowledge is used to beat each other up or have a debate. And actually, we use this knowledge to try to lift you up to make you more aware because when you run around and say things that you don't know what you're talking about, it's my job as a brother to correct you because I'd rather correct you at home than correct you in public because then it shows dissension and people like driving a wedge between us. And I just try to share information to bring people up on an accord so that when you go out there and engage in intellectual battle, you're well equipped to deal with the forces because we're dealing with demonic forces. I don't care what nobody say. Ignorance is evil. And willful ignorance is even more dangerous. But I'm going to step off my soapbox. I just had to put that out there. No, you're right and exact, Brother Tab. I think we got Brother Black on the check-in. Brother Black, you ready? Brother Black, Brother Black, what's good? What's good? Peace, y'all. Peace, peace, peace. Uh, interesting commentary. Uh, brother Tad, welcome back. Um, thank you, brother. I heard you talking smack last week, but it's all good. I couldn't get through. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> Sister Marcia really missed you, bro. She ain't had nobody to go at it with. You was here. She could argue with you. Nah, nah. You I, ain't, I don't know. Started messing with my signals. You made yeah, Mer Mercury go into retrograde <laughs> and just shut down all my communications. Hey, you should have had your rose quartz crystal so you could have just went through that. Look, and yo, no loud black. I was riding through Klan country. I was in the back roads of, of North Carolina. I was like, hold up. <laughs> hold up. Just get Petey Pablo to ride with you next time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Here we go with the shenanigans. Here we go. We missed you, brother Tad. You take your shirt off and wave it like a helicopter, bro. You already know. <laughs> well, I'm glad to be back, though. Glad to see you back, brother. Now, Just, Misha, how you doing? I'm doing well, great, brother Black. You're looking I'm great, good. sweetie. Thank you, thank you. As I was saying to brother Ty earlier, I almost overslept. I tried to get me a quick nap in. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh my god, I gotta get up. <laughs> I tell you, you know, because I guess who's coming on in the second hour? Um, she sent me a lot of information, court documents, filings. She sent me a copy of the book. Um, she sent me some fragrances for you ladies. So we're going to be giving away some fragrances courtesy of Sister Pamela Smith. We'll talk about that when she get in here. So I got the hookup for y'all. I got the hookup for y'all. So um, I was reading all of those documents and, you know, sometimes I can get too entrenched. And I had them, you know, <laughs> right out on my bed and I'm reading them. So I had to um, take me a quick nap to refresh my eyes. It's a lot. It's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. And we definitely appreciate her coming in um, last week or the week before um, to give us some information about her case because it connects to so many other cases. And we'll get into all of that in a minute. So I hope you all did your homework assignment last week to see that I was right and exact. When you're looking at something that's titled national, more than likely it's headed by black people. When you look at something titled American, more than likely it is is headed by white people. So, Brother Tad, I know you was in and out um, last week trying to get in, but what I was saying to our audience is that 
um, I want us to learn how to identify things and be more aware of what of what it is that we're dealing with and who it is that we're dealing with. So I gave an example uh, last week of if you look at the American Medical Association or the American Bar Association or the American Dental Association uh, metrics, it doesn't matter. You will see that it is headed by white folks. But when you look at something titled national, whether it's National Dental Association, the National Medical Association, National Bar Association, it is headed by black people. Um, and that's for that's 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 purposefully done. Um, because when it comes to, as I've said many times on this program, we can believe that we are protected under certain rights and we have the same privileges, but legally and politically, we do not. Um, and that's why we catch so much hell in this country and abroad, because how this country treats its black people is a blueprint for others around the world. I mean, even Hitler uh, talked about that. So we have to be clear in how we identify things. Um, in this country. Now, speaking of identity, while Sister Marcia gets in here, um, when you hear ISIS, this came across my timeline, but when you hear about ISIS, you know, you know, what does it make you think of when you hear that on mainstream media? ISIS attacking or ISIS invaders or ISIS rebels or ISIS this. You know, what comes to your mind, um, I'm talking to the audience that is, of what ISIS really is. Um, I know Brother Tad knows what I'm talking about, but we're going to play the clip here, and we'll come right back and we'll discuss it. Hold on, family. Here we go. Uh, subversion, um, trying to foil plots against the state of Israel, political plots and others. You tell the story about how you tried to find out what the what they call the Mossad when they deal with uh, publicly? I thought it was a reasonable question, but the trouble is uh, you can't pick up the phone book. There's no uh, Langley in, uh, in Israel that you can look up you know, CIA or, in our case, uh, the Mossad. We thought we should ask, what shall we call it in English? You can translate the Hebrew words. As I said, Mossad is institute. But when they write a letter to their friends in the CIA or the British intelligence, what do they call themselves? It took a while. Uh, it was a matter of asking the prime minister's spokesman. The best you could do because officially uh, the Mossad is under the prime minister's office. And uh, I think he sort of wondered why you want to know and all that. So he explained. And he came up with uh, the Israeli Secret Intelligence Service. I mean, if it were to have initials, it would be ISIS. Just simple words like that. Interestingly enough, a kind of a British model. So, I know, you know, maybe some of you may not have thought, you know, this, thought about this, but now you do know the origins of where that comes from. So, Sister Farnessa always, always on the check in. She say, Israeli secret intelligence services. But in mainstream media, they negate this origin when they talk about these things. And it's very important that you do your due diligence and do your own research that you can find out um, information for yourself. As Brother Black always tells y'all, you know, do your own research and, uh, you know, see things for yourself. Um, Brother Ty, your thoughts on that clip? I knew that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but you, you know, for us, and that's sometimes what make people think we might be off the chain because we're saying information they never heard before. But that's because we're students of our culture. You know, sometimes people wait for other people to tell them what something means as opposed to being diligent in their own studies. I don't know if you remember years ago, what did I say? We're the ones who sit back and, and read them thick books and sit through them long, boring lectures and documentaries. We do that so we can condense the information and bring it to you. But if you want to know for yourself, this is our source. This is the source. You got to go to the primary source. Now we become secondary source. Go to the primary source, the people who are saying it themselves. And then look who funds them. Look who backs them because they are backed by the Clintons and others you know, who funnel money to them. Like, none of this is secret. It's just people People have lazy scholarship. It's just a level that they don't want to delve into because, how can I say this? They say a particular group can't tell them nothing. But if you pay attention to this particular group, you'll see what their strategy is and they're going to get ahead of you. They used to say, you know, black people get killed for reading. Now, 
black people wouldn't read if it killed them. You know, it's it's amazing. And the information is out there. We are in the information age. Like, we walking around with literal computers in our pockets. We can literally talk to somebody across the globe in real time. We could tap into any news in the world. We can look at Indian news, Jamaican news, Japanese news, Chinese news. We can look at anything. It, like, but people choose not to. And then when you present information from your due diligence, they're going to call you crazy. Meanwhile, their efforts is spent watching television or listening to the radio, getting the information from that source. Like, all right, do you. But when things start collapsing and, and people are safe and you like, how can I get safe? Like I told you five years ago. Told you five years ago how to get safe. Now people want to know what to do, right, Sister Keisha? I said years ago, pistols and passports. Pistols and passports. It's coming to the wire. If you're going to stay, be ready to fight. But if you're not ready to fight, be ready to bounce because they're not playing. All the laws that they're repealing, and it's a fear tactic because they understand how fear plays on the mind and breaks down the immune system, automatically makes you sick, coupled with the stuff that they already poisoning us with, but you ain't got the right mind state because they want to keep you in perpetual fear. You forgot how to live life and enjoy it. Psh, I'm Gucci. I just saw my grandma. Can't nobody tell me nothing. Can't I'm nobody good. tell me nothing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. And, you know, we played this uh, clip last week, but I really want y'all to get what he's saying because we've been talking about this for quite some time on this platform, how laws are being repelled. And we have to be very, very mindful. You know, they put a lot of distraction, as Brother Black says, in front of us to keep us distracted from what's really going on, from what's really going on. I went down to the courthouse um, for the uh, Trump jury selection um, on its first day. And I can tell <laughs> you it was pure mayhem, first of all. Um, shout out to my connect, how I get through stuff. But anyway, anyway. Um, how many jurors was dismissed? 90 something the first day. Mm. At least that's mm. what it was when I left. Because mm. it was that's going on when I left. That's yeah. a lot of people. Mm. And from what I saw, some of those that were chosen were actually um, immigrants. Mm. Who are now U.S. naturalized citizens. Of course. So um, it was quite interesting. Um, you could see that, you know, he lost some weight. Um, being pulled in so many directions. Um, I can tell you that his number one attorney, um, and I think I shared it with uh, Sister Katasha, Brother Kifaro, and Brother Tag, um, his point attorney is really not a trial attorney, but a political attorney. He's pretty much a fixer, if you will, in the political world. And so for all of you who wanted to know why it was that um, the former president's first attorneys quit the case is because they couldn't deal with that personality um, and they would not subject themselves to someone who never um, tried a case in a courtroom in his life. What he called himself, the, the, the point counsel? Something yes. like that? Mm -hmm. all, all the real lawyers had to go to him? With the <laughs> Like you said, a fixer. Yep. So it would cause a bit of dissension amongst the ranks. So that's why um, they um, uh, resigned from the case. But anyway, I'll tell you all I have to say is that this case in particular is very, very important. It is the first time that a U.S. president was tried of a criminal case of this nature. Um, and it all stems from a s alleged sexual act. So, um, and we said here many times, you know, you have to be mindful of your interactions as far as that is concerned, because they will use these things against you. They will find people who jilted lovers or, you know, people who felt they were, you know, unjustly not taken care of. From yeah, back in the said day, you was gonna be with me. You know, you all that gonna give me some money. You gotta be, you gotta be careful with these folks out here. Go ahead. It's, it's, it, and it's funny you say that because when you said distractions, the first thing I thought about was P Diddy. 
he's still not arrested. And how many weeks ago that's been since they raided his home? And still haven't found enough evidence, I guess, to make an indictment? I mean, again, it's a horse and pony show. And like we said before, he must have pissed somebody off in a high place. And he got the goods. And I think they're trying to find evidence to destroy it before they bring him down so that he can't hold the ace in a hole, so to speak. You know, it's it's an ugly game. And we don't have the luxury to not be invested in what's going on around us. Not the P. Diddy thing, because I told people last year when, when Keith E. D. got arrested and they was like, yeah, he said Puppy paid a million dollars. What the, I think I was on this platform said, Puppy's not going to jail. At least not for that. That he's not going to go to jail for. And then next thing you know, we get all new allegations. But people don't recognize the horse and pony show. I don't know how we call the ops our ops and then take everything they say for face value and run with it against our own folks. And again, this is not in defense of Puppy. I don't know him. But I'm just saying I know a setup when I see one. And our folks don't. Like, I knew Bill Cosby was going to be home. I said this. First of all, he wasn't supposed to go to jail. But how many people, you know what I'm saying? And not saying that things he did wasn't right. Because we all make mistakes and, and, and do things that's, you know, kind of iffy. But iffy actions don't lead to lifetime jail sentences. It ain't like he murdered anybody or, or stole it. We knew all them people lied on him. And that's why he was able to come home. But again, people don't do the due diligence and study deeper. So me, I like to, I actually like to hold my, not opinion, but you know, I'm not going to indict somebody or even convict them until I hear all the evidence, not just accusations and allegations, but we in the Me Too movement. And this is what people do. They hear something and they run with it. Yeah, he did it. He did it. Yeah, he might be a freak. Yeah, I'm certain he had freak offs. But again, like we said, jilted lovers. People get their feelings hurt, and then all of a sudden, you the bad guy. And again, this ain't no defense of Puffy, but this is what they do to us time and time again. And then after it's all said and done, after they run us through the ringer, then all we get is an apology. They did the same thing to Sammy Davis Jr., did the same thing to Red Fox. They tried to do the same thing to Prince. Same Jack thing to Michael Jackson. Jackson. Jack Johnson, so so many people, so many of our people. And then you know, the insult um, with Jack Johnson, because I don't know if you guys know, those in the listening audience know that the movie King Kong was um, <laughs> I don't even loosely say based it. off of Jack Johnson. <laughs> Pretty much, um, it was their because... dog whistle, like National and American. Those are dog yes. whistles. It doesn't get, it's ambiguous in terms of the race, but those key words mean something. Like we said before, you know, in certain writings, you know, when they talk to white men, when they say citizens and they put capital C and lowercase c, it's for second class citizens, meaning non-white people. Capital C is first class citizen. Just that little nuance right there. But you got to study, you got to read, you got to research, be a student. Don't just jump on the internet and think you know some things without even looking them up. And don't take the first little Google site you find. Because chances are, that's misleading. In fact, Google itself is misleading. Facts. I'm glad you said that. These are violators of free speech. Yes. Um, when you look at these platforms, they are they are guiding uh, free speech. And that all, to me, is a cover for what's coming down the pike. They're trying to stop the onslaught of these assaults stories like pamela smith and others they're trying to stop these stories so they try to curtail the language and the problem with that is it hinders people who don't know how to articulate their problems um or their grievances if you will in a way that is satisfying to these platforms so they start giving you strikes they ban you you know they keep you off they don't even 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 google itself that's why I don't use it as a search engine. But when you use it and you put in certain words, it will tell you that these things are highly offensive. Even if you use some of these AI, if you, you try using some of these AI uh, platforms, they too will tell you some of these words 
or, 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 or slanderous or disrespectful or whatever. But this is a problem when you have a system that is trying to curtail um, free speech and government is complicit um, for whatever reason. But we have to continue to fight against that because if we can't fight with our voices, the second thing is, as Brother Taz said, is pistols and passports. And a lot of people are fed up, not just black people, but just people in general. I don't know if you guys have been seeing all these protests that have been happening around the country as it relates to Palestine and the migrant issue. Um, they had um, they pulling up on city councils. They pulling up on bridges, stopping traffic from uh, going across the bridges. You have police shutting down one protest, and they set up site, set up shop across the street. It's just been crazy across the uh, the subway systems here in New York. I know in California, the Golden Gate Bridge, they shut that down. Um, so you know, people are getting tired of the foolishness. And um, next week, and then the week after at the BK William Mackey History Club, shout out to them. They had Dr. Arthur Lewis uh, last night. You guys can see that video is posted on the Thorough Black Talk Facebook page. But I'm going to be connecting the dots or showing you how they use our culture, number one, um, for their own marketing and economic purposes. I'm going to use one entertainer and show you how they do this. Also, when you talk about the they, who are the they that we're talking about? Who are the one percent? And we're going to talk about these families. There's less than a hundred of them, but we're going to talk about these families um, next week. I hope we don't get striked for that. But um, I'm pulling this information out of their own publications. Like I said, they bank on you not reading these publications, but some of us do. And so, you know, I'm going to show you um, who these families are, what they're doing. Um, how they control politicians, if you will, in particular, the Democratic Party. Um, yes, they do it with the Republican Party. We know that. But the intricate workings of the Democratic par Party is diabolical um, right now. And so we'll get into all of that. And as I played last week, I'm going to play this clip again of Judge Greg Mathis confirming <laughs> what we've been saying about them repelling all of these laws. Go ahead, Brother Black. Real quick, Sister Keisha, I just want to ask uh, for the listening audience, some of those publications you talk about that we read that, that most of us don't so that they can know what to look for in the event they become so interested. Facts. Facts. One of, one of the publications, and I'll talk about this next week as well, um, is the Cranes Magazine. And I always tell y'all about Cranes Magazine. They tell you who the financial players are in this country and abroad. And they tell you point blank, um, you know, who they're backing. What, like, for example, you have here in New York, um, Governor Kathy Hochul, who is now trying to shut down or, or use government powers to shut down these illegal smoke shops that are around the country. And when you look at it on the surface, you figure, well, it's just the governor doing her job, so on and so forth. But someone is putting pressure on the governor. And it's these commercial developers, in particular in Midtown, who have got together and called her to a meeting. And I'll show y'all the information next week um, that um, she needs to do something about this. They can't do anything with the um, renters of these commercial properties because it's these illegal smoke shops that are consistently paying the rent, right? Because people can't afford these commercial spaces, excuse me, um, too much. So they are footing the bill. So there's a bit of a tug of war, you know, between powers to um, get involved in this. And so, of course, um, Governor Kathy Hochul was called to the carpet. To do something about it. So when you look about, you know, why is she doing this all of a sudden? It's because commercial real estate developers have called her to a meeting to do just that. And so we'll talk about those developers and stuff next week as well. So let me just play this clip again and we'll come back and bring Sister Marcia in here so we could talk about the Garvey movie because our guests will be here in the nine o'clock hour. Here we go. 
I just heard on the radio a court ruling about minority businesses that is ridiculous. The court ruled that the Minority Business Development Agency of the federal government no longer has to just uh, qualify minorities. They must also accept applications from whites, women, and others. So they've essentially uh, eliminated the business development agencies that help small minority businesses around the country. And guess what? So far, the Biden administration said they're not going to appeal. You know, this they, they eliminate the quality educations in the inner city, putting us at a disadvantage, then don't want to give us a hand up with affirmative action, eliminated that. Now, knowing that they don't help finance black businesses around the country, now you're going to eliminate the federal program that does help with that. I mean, what's the deal here? They're taking back everything that black folks have fought for, just like they did back after slavery during the Reconstruction era. We had black banks. We had the Freedmen Banks. We had uh, black politicians, black Congress folks. Supreme Court came in, a conservative Supreme Court, Supreme Court and eliminated all of that. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing now. We got to continue to fight, folks. Don't lay down. Stand up. Fight back. Shout out to Judge Greg Mathis. I mean, here you have a judge <clears throat> confirming, excuse me, <clears throat> what we've been talking about here on Thorough Black Talk. We have to be very mindful of that because for a long time in this country, um, we've had, we have had limited, if you will, federal protections, and these things are being repelled. So I don't want everybody to, you know, sweep this under the rug as if it doesn't affect you because now you have the repel of affirmative action. As he said, a lot of our children can't get into these college programs that they once were able to uh, anymore. And um, this is problematic. And we have a lot of co-conspirators um, in the mix, including, as Brother uh, Ray Ray says, the boule is definitely at work as far as this is concerned. But um, I want to show this clip and then we'll come right back and we'll talk about um, uh, Messiah the movie. Give me a second, family. Here we go here. I unequivocally reject the racist assumption of white America's ideology that God created the black man inferior. Because if Negroes are created in God's image and Negroes are black, then God too must in some sense be black. It is time to unite our brothers and sisters across the country and sail to Africa. Liberia is calling us now. And what happens when the government tries to stop us? By the time they try it, it will already be too late. They claim to have lifted the Negro race to persuade Negroes into buying stock in the Black Star Line. This child is politically driven. They want to end the movement by assassinating my character. By not taking the plea, you face a mandatory five years in prison. Do you see any fear in my eyes? Who does he think he is? Black Moses. You'd better stop him quick. He's gonna tear this whole country apart. How much longer will you endure the pain and suffering that this country places upon you? Dive down, black men, dive down and dig. Hold your head high, Marcus. You are not the first. The system has tried to break, and you will not be the last. The future of our people relies on you. Africa for the Africans. Um, great, great film. Sister Marcia, welcome to the platform, sister. Um, you and I, we got a chance to see this film um, this weekend. Um, written by Sam Lee, executive producer Gerard. Um, we 
had a great time viewing the film. Um, Sister Marcia, I'm going to get off my soapbox. I'm going to let you come in first and give your perspective on this great short film on the trial of Marcus Messiah Garvey. First of all, let me say happy Black Thursday to the Black Tastics folks on Thorough Black Talks. How is everybody doing? All right. Peace. All sis. right. All right. Peace. Um, so the film was fabulous, you know, 40 minutes and it's worth creating a dialogue, you know, because there are so many of um, non-Garveyites that are out there that need to create dialogues and even Garveyites, right? Um, just because we honor the work that he did a hundred years ago, the work is still very valuable today because we're still in that systemic oppression that stood a hundred years ago. And until we realize that, we're going to continue in the cycle of oppression. And if, and it's part of the arrested development, I rather not deal with the stuff and you know, buy stuff and remove myself away from the struggle. We have to stop being so detached to the struggle as a community, as a family of Black people who have continually been in this position. I appreciated the scene. I'm not going to give it all away, but there's a particular scene where he digs his own grave. Um, I appreciate that scene because to be able to dig your grave and come out of it on the other side and face certain demons makes you a stronger person. And I appreciated that scene more than anything else in the whole entire movie. Great, great um, film. Um, I liked what Baba Amin said. Um, he talked about how the, co the excuse me the correlation between uh, Garvey and as a man and a boy, um, that connection that they both have. I mean that 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 scene um, explains. Mm -hmm. Hold on one second. I'm gonna try to get this up on the screen of Baba Amin talking about it. Give me one second, family. Uh, let me see. Here we go. Here we go. I got that. I got it. Here we go. Let's check it out. That's what I'm talking about. Come on, Baba. Come on. Say that again. I gotta know, Baba, because you know. It was an honor to be a consultant on the film. I ain't gonna lie, I stayed and I recorded the credits because I had to see my name. There you go, Baba. This is the first ever narrative film about Marcus Garvey's life. So, right. so this is a history-making project, an underground, independent yes. project for making history. We don't need them. We are all we need. That's right. That's what's up. That's what's up. I appreciate y'all. We'll, we'll get down to South Carolina. We'll get down there. Uh-oh, you heard that. Yes. <laughs> Marcia, Marcia, throw a black to a crew. She is a eat. <laughs> Why you did that to me? I thought you said you were going to cut that scene out. Come on. I was oh, my face. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just let you know. I had not eaten that morning. I was late and I said it. You know, like, you know how they say you speak things into existence? I said, I hope I'm not late. And I still was late. Because, you know, the night before, there was a 90s party in the hood. And it was a great time. And... <laughs> Sister girl just couldn't get Where's her. that video? <laughs> Did hey, you have 40 hey, ounces hey, door knockers on? Hey, 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 hey brother Taz. You got door knockers on, though. Brother Taz, Sister Marcia was twerking to Icy, to icy Hot and Spicy Red. No, no. <laughs> icy Hot and Spicy Red. No, no, no. Oh, my God. Let me, let me play oh, this man. clip and we'll come back and we'll, we'll continue the discussion. Here we go. So what do you think, Young King, about the film? I think it's a great film about Marcus Garvey's life and a very great, um, very, very example. And, and um, it's a very good movie overall. Appreciate y'all coming now. Bye-bye, Amin. Right, yes. Look, I just want to shout out to the whole crew at Messiah. 
did a great job. Special shout out to Brother Duval. Yes. Excellent depiction. The, the way the snapshot of Barbie's, Barbie's life is very powerful. It makes you want to feature feet. You know, on guard, you know, and on 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 the honorable Mark beside Garvey, and how they superimpose his childhood, a key, a key part of his childhood, with a key part of his manhood. I just thought that that was that was very cleverly done. So yeah, great job. So Love you said we should make a feature film out of it. Oh yes, it definitely should be a feature. Matter of fact, it should be a series. Uh -oh. Matter of fact, we need a series. That was like episode one. You know, uh -oh. like you hear like that, you hear that saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We calling for that. We call that into existence right now. Mosiah the series. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I enjoyed this thoroughly. Um, I love that it wasn't just a one time piece part. It was it was collective um, uh, images within that it was collective time. I love the the, the showing of uh, him and uh, Amy's uh, relationship. I love it, just the detail. I just like it so much. I love how they went back and forth from the night. Yet, night yet. So what do you think, young? So family, um, again, it's a great, great film to see. Um, it should be shown at a film festival in your city or your town. Please follow Messiah the movie on social media platforms so that you can be abreast of when it's coming to your city so you can check it out. Great, great movie. In particular, um, Sister Marcia, um, we're not going to give it any scenes away, but that interaction with the FBI and its um, oppression, if you will, of witnesses against Garvey, that scene was intriguing. The way they were able to pressure them brothers in the courtroom, but I don't want to give too much away. Your thoughts on that, Sister Marcia? Yes, yeah, sis. Um, this is what happens to us today, even today. You know, even if we look through particular conversations that happen with um, the Black Panther movement, with, um, oh, what's that other organization? I can't think of it right now. But these, these slick jives that they do and make you want to like, I need to survive. My family's line is on, on the line if I don't move this way. Because we have, like you said, we have no um, military capacity that can make us feel safe. We rely on them to keep us safe and they cannot keep us safe. Only we can do that. But again, we dealing with a collective of people that have been arrested, developed for a thousand years, right? This didn't just start with us. And, and the loss of confidence with our autonomy and our ability to secure our family, our nation, and our community, and even our global presence. So yeah, that it was very powerful. It is something that we should use as a tool to um, have greater conversations in our community. And lastly, I was just so mad that there was only 1,900 people there. There needed to be 19 billion people in the room. You get the clubs got billions of people, but when you're talking about conversation or black people doing things, you got nine people. Make me, I'm, I swear. Well, some here's the thing with film festivals. It's mostly limited seatings, right? It's for people in the industry to view the film because um, you want to get garner more support and also more financial support. So that's why these um, film festivals normally are very intimate settings. So seating is very, very limited um, in majority of these film festivals. It's not the full production of the film. Um, it's just a short. So that's why you have smaller intimate settings. This is the beginning stages of what it takes to produce a major film, if you will. So um, whenever film festivals come around, you either plug your film or um, you, are request, you have a request um, to play your film at these festivals to garner more um, you know, momentum behind it. But again, great. To see it, please follow Messiah the movie um, so that you can check it out possibly at a film festival near you soon. Now, 
we had a couple of weeks ago our sister Pamela Smith on this program, and she talked about um, her trauma of dealing with SA um, in a penile boot uh, uh, work camp, if you will, and um, men in power um, were able to not only assault her in this way, but also try to hide her story, try to cover up her story, try to, um, if you will, trash evidence um, in the case. Um, you had players in the case who, you know, shifted their living spaces, whether they left Tulsa, Oklahoma and came to New York or whatever. Um, this sister has filed not only in the courtroom in the court of Tulsa, Oklahoma, but also here in New York and other places to get justice. Um, and it made me think about um, Rosa Parks. Now, say, why do you think about Rosa Parks? Well, I know a lot of people, when you hear Rosa Parks, you think about the Montgomery bus boycott. And um, you think about all that she suffered after that Montgomery bus boycott. I believe later on in life, she worked as a cook and then as a janitor um, later on in her life. But no one connects Rosa Parks to as an investigator in the Reese Taylor uh, great in, um, in the South. People don't understand that Rosa Parks was an investigator for the NAACP. And she often investigated these types of crimes. That's the number one reason why the system was against Rosa Parks. It had nothing to do with the Montgomery bus boycott, but it had everything to do with her investigative work in these type of crimes. And when you talk about Rosa Parks, I rarely hear anybody mention that great work that this woman did. Um, and that's for a reason. That's why they keep throwing the Montgomery bus boycott at you to distract what her real work was in the movement. Um, now, bring it to today. Um, you have the horrible, horrible case of Sade uh, Robinson um, in the assault, dismemberment of her body. Um, I want you to remember the attack, the kidnapping and rape of uh, Tawana Brawley here in New York in the 1980s. I want you to remember the uh, rape and uh, murder of Lavinia Johnson in the U.S. military. Um, these cases are not often talked about. However, they are all linked. So you cannot talk about B.C. Taylor and you not talk about Rosa Parks. You cannot talk about Rosa Parks and you don't talk about Pamela Smith. You can't talk about Pamela Smith without connecting that to Tawana Brawley. All of these cases are very much linked and the circumstances surrounding these cases are pretty much the same. Um, in particular, the case of Tawana Brawley, her legal representation, the attorney at War Automatics was the first to demand and successfully, successfully gain a special prosecutor in a case. Um, so when I started to read the case file of Pamela Smith, she too demanded a special prosecutor in her case because you can't seek justice from the criminal element that assaulted you and that's protecting said criminal element. And a lot of attorneys are afraid, especially black attorneys, to seek and demand a special prosecutor. So um, the last time she was here, she gave us a lot of insight into her story. So tonight she's coming back with Sister Janae and um, to take questions from our audience because we couldn't, we didn't have enough time to do that last time. I want to give you guys some information on her book um, and other things that she has going on. And, you know, what better way than on Thorough Black Talk, we bring the, you know, the information to you live and direct. So. Uh, um, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, Go ahead, Finish, please. Go ahead brother. Um, another person we have to really talk about in this light is a young sister, maybe some of y'all out there will remember her name, Sharice Iverson. 
That's all yes. I got to say. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's so many, so many of these type of cases. And, um, you know, I want y'all, as our sister talks to you tonight, answer your questions. Remember that we explained on this platform very carefully and diligently the difference between natural rights and civil rights. And the black woman, as Malcolm said, is the most unprotected in this nation, the most disrespected in this nation. And we have to get justice. When you talk about me too, it's us first. I don't want to hear me too without us first. It's us first. Then we can talk about a me too, but it's us first. So until we get justice, excuse me, for our grandmothers and great grandmothers, until we get justice for May Louise Miller, and we had Dr. Harrell on this program, and she gave you the case of May Louise Miller. Not only did she suffer these time, kinds of attacks on a um, sharecropping plantation in Mississippi, but so did her mother. Um, and I thank Dr. Harrell for coming in and giving us that story, along with the Reverend Johnny Lee Gaddy. He too felt this face, this same type of assault at a group home in Florida. And you hear the pain in Reverend Gaddy's voice. If you read his book, you will understand even more of the trauma that he faced because they see us all today as they did back then as property. So tonight um, we welcome back our sister Pamela Smith. She wasn't she wasn't able to get on live with us last time, but we figured it out. Sister Janae got her on and popping tonight. Well, she fixed it. She fixed it. So we got the queen mother in here, Pamela Smith and General Janae in the building. Welcome back to another episode Hi. of Mother Black Talk. We are glad Hi. to have y'all both here with us live and direct on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, to give us more information, more insight on this uh, particular case. Um, you were able to call in with us last week, uh, Queen Mother, but we have you live here and direct. Um, reintroduce yourself, if you will, to our viewer audience as we get through your story tonight. Uh, good evening. Uh I am Pamela Smith, and I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, I like to uh, say thank you, Keisha, and all your staff for having me here this evening again. It's an honor to be able to tell the story to my people that understand this injustice that we as Black women uh, endure in uh, white America. I want to first say thank you to God who has kept me in all of my footsteps. I'd like to thank uh, again you, Keisha, for this opportunity to be able to speak. I'd like to thank Janae Cook, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and the Nation of Islam that has been so graciously good to me standing by my side for many years. For the Black Panthers, and I'd like to thank uh, the new uh, brothers and sisters that's coming on board, the NFAC. And I just like to thank God for my family and my many supporters I have around the world, all around the world. And I, again, I'm so honored and thankful for Black Press for telling my story because white media has hid this story for many years. Uh, I'm just grateful and thankful to God that I'm alive. I, 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 it's, only, it's only by the grace of God that I'm still living. Uh, I was an inmate on a work release program. I went to prison for checks and credit cards. Uh, I used to have an addiction. I used to be on crack cocaine. I never drank or smoked in my life. And I met a man that introduced me to drugs. I uh, didn't know anything story to that was. I ended up uh, going to prison. And while I was in prison, uh, uh, I went to work on the work release program here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 575 East 36th Street North in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And while I was on this work release program, just trying to get home to my family, my next step to get home, I was raped and sexually assaulted uh, 
by Donna Reed Cochran, the state driver's examiner for the Department of Public Safety. He raped me, uh, my rape began in November of 1997, and it went all the way up until May of 1998. Uh, my first encounter was he asked to see my breasts. Uh, my brother came to see me. He told me I broke the uh, rules and uh, my hell began. Uh, one thing led to another. I recall on uh, my birthday, February the 6th of 1988, I was raped. Uh, April the 10th of 1998, I was tortured with a glass salt shaker to say goodbye to a dying sister. My sister was in the hospital and I wanted to say goodbye to my older sister. So in order for me to go see Alwita before she died, Donna Reed Cochran went in the storage room and where I kept my cleaning supplies as a housekeeper. And he found these, uh, the, uh, some glass salt shaker. And he came to me and told me, in other words, before I could go see Alwita to stand over my sister so she could hear my voice, or even if I could just breathe over my sister, uh, I had to be tortured with this glass salt shaker. And all I wanted to do was to just say goodbye to Alwita. You know, I knew she was had fallen ill and sick, and so I wanted to see my sister. But I got raped that morning, April the 10th of 1998, at the Department of Public Safety with this glass salt shaker. Shoved up my vagina. It cut me, it hurt me. And I recall uh, on April the 10th of 1998, I wanted to go see her, but I had to continue to run in the bathroom at the Department of Public Safety and keep padding, uh, padding my underwear because I was bleeding. But I felt like that getting to see Alwita, I would deal with this later on. Uh, my sister saying goodbye to my sister was more important at that time because I come from a family of eight. And uh, my mother and father raised us to be close siblings. And when my dad walked off and left my mom, my older sister and brother, have raised the other sisters and brothers that were left behind. So I felt compelled to go say goodbye to Alwita. And uh, so I got to go to the hospital and see her. My sister died April the 12th of 1998. And uh, I've been fighting for justice and begging for justice uh, for 28 years. I stood on truth. I don't know nothing else but to tell but the truth. I delivered evidence. I've been fighting this case, begged all law enforcement, attorney generals, FBI, governor, uh, district attorneys. I done got out and did uh, three grand juries to petition to get uh, 5,000 signatures to get a grand jury. I seated the grand jury. When I seated the grand jury, uh, they, uh, with the evidence of a glass salt shaker couldn't show up because it had been destroyed by the state officials. Once I identified the glass salt shaker to the lieutenant that went to the Department of Public Safety to retrieve the glass salt shaker, he brought it to me to identify it at the storage room where this rapist, Donna Reed Cochran, had left it. And so this lieutenant named Lieutenant George Randolph went to the Department of Public Safety and he retrieved it and found it and he brought it to me to identify it. And once I identified it, he told me he was taking it to the district attorney's office for criminal charges. And he did that. So for years, I've been fighting, begging all law enforcement to help me. They uh, destroyed the evidence. They destroyed the medical records. They destroyed the prison files. They destroyed the affidavits. They destroyed the polygraph. They destroyed everything. But by the grace of God, uh, a district attorney had given me a, a paper that I had no clue what it was because, like most of us, we don't work in district attorney's office. We don't know what an intake sheet is. He gave it to me when I was trying to do my uh seek my grand jury. I didn't know what it was, so I put it up. In 2018, the Oklahoma Attorney General told me to my face at that time, his name was uh, uh, somebody just sent me a question and it kind of threw me off, but anyway, uh, Drew Emerson uh, was the Oklahoma Attorney General and he, uh, I met him in Oklahoma City and he told me that uh, I uh, wasn't raped with no glass salt shaker. There wasn't no glass salt shaker. And I told him he was a lie. Yes, I was raped with a glass salt shaker. I know what happened to me. 
So I came home and I sat on my bed and I cried out to God and said, how could this man tell me I wouldn't wait with a glass salt shaker? He's the Oklahoma attorney general at that time. His name was Drew Evanson. And so God just put it in my spirit to start rambling through some papers. I got up and started rambling through some papers. Holy Pacal. I found this document that said uh, intake sheet, victim rape by instrumentation of a glass saw shaker, shoved up victim's vagina, shown to victim by uh, Oklahoma Highway Patrol, Lieutenant George Randolph. So I called this lawyer and asked him, could I come down and talk to him? Because I found a piece of paper and I didn't know what it was. So I went down and took it to the lawyer and he said, Pamela, this is the smoking gun. They've been saying you wasn't raped, there wasn't no evidence, and you was making this up for money. And he said, my God, this is the evidence. Where did you get it? I said, well, this district attorney gave it to me. I didn't know what it was. I just put it up somewhere. All those years I've been called a liar, been scandalized. I knew the truth. But before I got that piece of paper had it, I didn't need that piece of paper to know I was raped with a glass salt shaker. I know what happened to me. I was raped so many times at the Department of Public Safety that I couldn't even begin to count them. And, and how is that so? I went to the state employees. And I told them that I was uh, being abused by this guy, Donna Reed Cochran Sr. They laughed in my face. They thought it was a joke. I went to everybody I could. I went to the FBI four or five times, asking them to help me. And then when I went to the FBI in October 2018, I took the intake sheet of the glass salt shaker to prove that it was a glass salt shaker that was shoved up my vagina, cut me and hurt me. And then the FBI going to ask me after three or four prior visits to them, he going to ask me in October 2018, well, Miss Smith, can I ask you two questions? Yes, you can, sir. How did you get this evidence? Law enforcement gave it to me. Miss Smith, what's driven you? And I said, uh, justice in God. And so I told him I was raped by Donna Reed Conkrey, the state driver's examiner. I told them this so many times. The FBI don't come to me. I go to the FBI. You don't go to the FBI if you're lying. You go to the FBI with truth. They don't knock on my doors. I knock their doors down because I want my justice. I've been fighting for 28 years. I done seated grand juries. I done begged every lawyer in the state of Oklahoma. I done spent over three or $400,000 fighting this case. The state of Oklahoma offered me $100,000 to take this uh, uh, money and go away. And I told him I wasn't going to take this money because I promised God I was going to tell this story. I want justice for my other sisters that's raped and abused in the state of Oklahoma. They let black women's statute of limitations run. E. Jean Curl, is a white woman, said that the president of the United States raped her. She didn't have no evidence. She don't even know where she was raped. She just said the president raped her. She told a friend, I had DNA. I had uh, documentations. That I, I had polygraphs. I had everything to substantiate my truth. But the state officials in the state of Oklahoma destroyed everything to try to destroy my truth. And when this glass salt shaker intake sheet surfaced, you can't find these crooks down here now. they just a bunch of liars and crooks. The state of Oklahoma is corrupt. And when it comes to black women being raped and abused, they sweep our cases under the, uh, under the carpet. And let me say this to you, to all of your listeners, Keisha. I ain't going nowhere. I promise God I'm going to fight to the death of me. You're not going to rape me with a glass salt shaker. You're not going to torture me. You're not going to take evidence and destroy it and then go out and call me a liar, call me a Jezebel to try to attack my character, to try to stop me. I don't walk in fear. I know who my God is. I stand on truth and I'm thankful to God for all the brothers and sisters that stand around the world, in every country, in the world, in every state in the United States, that knows of Miss Pamela Smith's case. I must tell this story. I must get justice. Not only for Pamela Smith, I must get justice for all of my sisters around the world that have found themselves in this same situation that the white men know they raped black women and then they want to go and abuse our bodies and call us liars. But when a white woman says she's raped, they believe her all hell break, break loose. But when a black woman says she's raped and have the evidence, they still find a way to attack and deny her justice. And so I have fought so hard because I know the truth. You can't tell me I wouldn't rape me no glass salt shaker. And so when I uh, uh, delivered the evidence of the glass salt shaker, I filed uh, November uh, 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 2019. 
I believe if I stand to be corrected, I filed in November 22nd of 2019. I went to the Northern District in Tulsa, Oklahoma to discover new developed evidence, and they still ain't answered me. I wrote to uh, Governor J. Kevin Stitch three times, begging him to call in an outside federal prosecutor. He wouldn't help me. He ignored all three letters. I even uh, been to Washington, D.C. I've been to Washington, I started in 2009 when I flew me and the NAACP to come out there and meet with the senator from Tulsa, Oklahoma, named Tom Goldberg. When we got to his office in Washington, D.C., his staffer came out and said, oh, it's a scheduling problem. Tom is not here. We done flew all the way out there and the senator from Tulsa couldn't see us. They didn't want to see us because if they had knowledge of knowing this, they had to do something about it. I done wrote every congressperson in here. I done even wrote all my black congresspeople on the hill, from Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, to Cory Booker, you name them, to Maxine Waters, Sheila Jackson, telling this story. And it still couldn't get help for a black woman. You know how black people talk that game about we for our people? No, they not. I done been to Washington, D.C. on this case so many times. I done been to Supreme Court twice. I first went to Supreme Court in 2009. Then I revisit the United States Supreme Court uh, February the 25th of 2021. My writ went to the Supreme Court. They don't hear the cries of black women. They don't hear the cries of, of black women that's raped and abused and sexually assaulted. I know the Supreme Court says that they only hear so many pro se cases. How many times do you have to deny Miss Pamela Smith? If a woman gonna keep coming to y'all two times, you need to be like that lady in the Bible in Luke when she kept going to that judge and wearing him down. He got tired of her coming, so he went on and gave her justice. But they don't have to give me my justice because I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to wear them down. I want my justice. I got to get my justice. I got to continue to fight and lift my voice for all my sisters that still being raped and abused, and they allow our statutes of limitations to run out. You don't rape women with glass salt shakers, and then the state officials have the privilege to go destroy the glass salt shaker, then go out and call a black woman a Jezebel, and go out in the black community and try to attack her character and try to sc scandalize her. Five agencies in the state of Oklahoma, one guy named uh, John uh, Tom Gruber, he wrote me a letter and said all five of the state agencies got to close this case. Now, that was in February of 2010. Holy Pacal in uh, October, uh, 2018, here I come up with the evidence. Now you can't find them. They've been so busy shutting down Pamela Smith, blocking Pamela <laughs> Smith, denying me justice, backdating documents, destroying documents, destroying prison files, medical records. They have did everything they could on this case. And and and, and when they offered me a hundred thousand dollars and I told them no, I was fifty cents, I was fifty cents broke to my name. But I promised God that I wouldn't take no money. I have an $8.3 billion lawsuit filed in the New York court. If I never see a dime of that, all I ever ask these white boys to do, these elite establishment that don't respect black women, all I wanted these people to do was do what was right. Give me my justice. All I want is to be treated like a white woman. When a white woman say a black man raped her, they rushed to go lock up the black man. They rushed to believe her lies. In 1921, a white woman lied and said in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that a black man winked at her, raped her, and they tore up our whole city. And that went of that 100 years, 20 years of that, here's Miss Pamela Smith, raped by a white state driver's examiner, and you don't want to give us our justice. You want to go and scandalize a black woman, lie and, 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 and see what it is, Radio Land. Keisha and all your listeners, if we deny Miss Pamela Smith, it's to send a message to all my other sisters that you can't get justice. So what you want to do is crip and paralyze my other sisters. That's why I fight so hard, because I want the justice for my sister. I want to send a message that it's unacceptable to do this to us. You don't shove glass salt shakers up a woman's vagina. Salt is a preservative. You don't rape women with glass salt shakers, and then you all have a privilege to go and call her a liar, and then you want to come along and offer her $100,000. It didn't come from a good place, you guys. In 2003, they offered me that $100,000. You know why they offered me that $100,000? Because August the 12th of 2003, I made a major ruling at the 10th Circuit Court of Appeal. I won on the Fourth Amendment, the Fourteenth uh, Amendment, the Eighth Amendment, cruel law use punishment. So in 2003, when a major ruling came, 
them of Colorado, they got together in December 2003 and said, hey, we got to stop her. Don't let her go to court. Whatever you do, don't let her go to court. My lawyer called me and said, hey, kiddo, they want to pay you some money to settle this case. Can you come to my office? She was in bed with them, too. They all white folks. They all stick together. They all crooked. They dirty. No good. I don't care if they supposed to be your lawyer. You better know yourself who your God is when you're in a battle and fighting. She called me to her office and said, this is in December 2003. Kid all the state offered her 30000 60000 90000 I believe it got up to 100000 And they said, Miss Payer, uh, you need to take that money. That's a lot of money for an inmate. Keisha and all your listener audience, I was broke. But I remember that promise to God. I said, I don't want it. I'm going to trial. When I went to trial January the 4th of 2004, they called me everything but a, the N-word. They told an all-white jury to look at him and then look at her. Look mean to zoom in. So what you saying? Look at her skin color. Told an all-white jury to look at her and then look at him and see who's lying. The glass salt shaker couldn't come because the glass salt shaker was destroyed in 1999. Everything that they did to try to destroy justice for Miss Pamela Smith, they did it, but I still stand. I thank God for the brothers that's coming to see about me. I thank God for the Panthers that have been here so many times. These are some vicious white people down here. They don't respect the rule of law because they got all these courts in bed with them. They got the state courts, the district courts, the circuit courts, and the Supreme Court. These people are all in bed in for injustice when it comes to people of color. They don't care how wrong it is. And I say this, and, and somebody probably ain't going to agree with me. You know, a lot of people can relate to what's going on with our president, especially black people. He's getting a taste of what black people have been going through for years. He's getting a taste of that. Because the Democratic Party, I was born and raised in a democratic family. My grandma and grandpa was dead. So I don't have to think and be used by the Democratic Party no more. I ain't going to be used by no party. I'm going to think for myself. I'm going to vote for my conscience. But I say this to my black people today. We have got to get away from how grandma and grandpa vote. Because that's brainwashing us. That ain't nothing but stere stereotyping black people. The Democratic Party has pimped and played us long enough. Them, they talk about Donald Trump, and I'm not going to spend my time. Donald Trump haven't did no more to black people than the Democratic Party's done. They have used us. They have beat us down. They have used our own party to ruin the black people. So I say to my people today, everybody I ever asked to help me on this case, in the beginning, when my rape started, they were a Democratic Party. The, the, the attorney general was a Democrat. The governor was a Democrat. All this was a Democratic Party that was abusing and, and, and using everything they could. When I went to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeal to take my documents, we found out that not only did the governor have a first cousin that was a judge up in Denver, Colorado, we got those documents. I never tell anything I can't support. I'm not saying he was a judge at the 10th Circuit Court of Appeal, but his first cousin came from Denver to swear him in as the governor of the state of Oklahoma when my case was up there in Denver, Colorado. How do you get fair justice? How do you get justice in a, in a state? We have called on the FBI. I have called on Congress, and they all cannot touch this case because they're afraid of the domino effect of all these people. 56 people and five agencies went after this one black woman. But I still stand by the grace of God. By the grace of God, I'm going to continue to lift my voice. I'm going to continue to fight. I don't walk in fear. I don't let fear mongering come to me. I know who I am. If I got to die, let me die for standing up for what's right. Let me I know die. that's right, let, Queen let Mother. Me die for putting it in. Let me I die. Know that's that right. In and Breonna Taylor and the other ones, they never got to live to tell their story. By the grace of God. Don't y'all know when I was raped and tortured with that glass salt shaker in the Department of Public Safety? Don't y'all know that that man could have that could have killed me? This man should have had attempted murder on him. This man should have had all the charges put on him. They never charged him. They want to use my skin color and my past to go out and attack me. 
and I'm still fighting today for my justice. And I'm going to get my justice, you guys. I know that's right. I'm gonna I know that's justice. right. I know that's right, Queen you Mother. Know, you know, this away. case is so reminiscent of the Tawana Brawley case. Everything that you're saying, the, the, the government cover-up, the prosecution cover-up, the connection between one of the accusers and his father in the courtroom. And as you said, you know, the racism within the courtroom, you know, you have that I've read uh, so far, several uh, federal appointed commissions mm -hmm. that were uh, mandated to find out about racism in the courtroom. And all of these commissions, all of them, including the two that were under a pre former President Obama, as she said, who did nothing. Did nothing. They all said that the United States courts, and I'm talking about local courts, circuit courts, appellate courts, and Supreme Courts are all infested with racism. That's what their appointed commission said. So, you know, you can't deny the evidence, you know, that she has brought forth for all of us to check out. And I want you guys to check out her book, The True Story of Pamela Smith, Begging for Justice. You guys can get this book. Um, I have it right here for you all to go through it up real quick where you can get this book because we want y'all to know more about this story and um, what better way to learn about it than find that out from Pamela Smith herself. So here is the information where you can order the book right here on the screen for you. Um, Pamela Smith, P.O. Box 470261, Tulsa, Oklahoma, zip code 74146. 74146. And for speaking engagements, for all of the streamers out there, if you want her on your platform, you can reach out to her at 918-282-7057. That's 918-282-7057. Uh, Sister Marcia, um, any questions for our guest this evening? I think you got to unmute. There you go. Um, again, Mama Smith, I just want to thank you for your courage and your bravery for doing this on behalf of all of us, right? We have over a million years of stories of them torturing us and having you stand up and fight for us for over 30 years is commendable. You know, you're not letting any trinkets of glory come before the pain and the saga. And again, my condolences for not only losing your sister, but this at the same time, anytime you connect that story, it must be very tragic. And your sister is encouraging you each and every day. I pray that you continue the, the struggle because you are thriving and anything I can do to help you to get this story amplified, I shall do so. So you can call on me as a daughter and as a reliable friend because I'm here to support. Definitely. Thank you, Sister Marcia. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you. Um, Sister Janae, welcome back to the platform. Um, hello, hello, hey, everybody. For those of you who don't remember, Sister Janae is, well, let me say it, General Nzinga in the building with us, who has been um, a key component um, in the fight with our sister Pamela Smith as of late. Um, sister Janae, tell us how you got involved in this in this story, and how did you come across uh, Sister Pamela Smith? Well, um, I just want to tell my queen, not just Pamela Smith, you must address her as Queen Pamela Smith. Her African name is Queen Nana Dede Okanzi. She was crowned the royal by the king Ghana of Ghana, King Nene Teche of Ghana. Came all the way to America. Well, he's he lives here, and he lives in Ghana as well. But he came to Washington D.C. to crown Pamela Smith as the Queen Mother. 
Now, my, my journey with Queen Mother Pamela Smith started four years ago when I first joined the Black, the New Black Panther Party. Um, it was my first uh, road trip, not first mission. Uh, we don't call them missions. We call them maneuvers uh, with the New Black Panther Party. And um, with Shaky Ma'am Akbar, and we drove 19 hours to Tulsa, Oklahoma. On our way to Tulsa, it was myself, Shaky Ma'am Akbar, and another gentleman that was an informant for the government sent to distract us from going to Tulsa, Oklahoma. His mission was to keep them out of Oklahoma and away from Pamela Smith. And that's something that nobody has ever had the privilege of hearing the story about what happened and how far that this government has went to keep this woman's story from being told. Okay, so that's where I come in. When I uh, first joined, I wasn't, I told everybody I wasn't living my best life. I was just, whatever. I was ready to die, freedom of death. I was tired of South Carolina. That's where I'm from. I left South Carolina after that boy Dylan Roof went in there and shot all those people in that church in Charleston, South Carolina. And I did not like the response from my community. I didn't like how we was, they were just trying to get along to get along. They would let love win. Hell no, I was ready to go to war. Okay. So I left the South. I moved to from Atlanta to Washington, D.C., Stumbled upon the new Black Panther Party, joined the party after the um, 10,000 Black Men's March, supporting that because I was doing my own podcast at the time. And we went to, um, you know, I went to the planning meetings for the march that whole week. They had a march planned up, we planned to have a 10,000 Black Men's March, and I ran into a shaky ma'am Akbar. I even quit my podcast and joined his Black Power Radio because it was just so important for our stories to get told. It's so like you guys cannot imagine how many people that are out here that are suffering our people. You know, my first mission with the New Black Panther Party was a, a boy being hung in Durham, North Carolina at a bus stop who they say he committed suicide at the bus stop. So going to, across country to see Queen Mother Pam was my first, not first road trip, but my first real mission, okay? And when I went out there, I didn't have expectations. I didn't know what I was going to experience. But when I heard her story, and I have to mute myself because it's overwhelming, because her story has not changed. You, a, a lie, you got to remember what you said. But Queen Mother Pam's story has not changed, not one bit. I can tell it backwards and forwards. You understand me? Black women don't lie about people violating us. There is no cases of black women accusing white men who were innocent of raping them. Look it up. Try it. Every black woman that said a white man raped her was raped by that white man. It's millions of cases of black women, black white women that accuse black men of raping them, but you'll never find one that was not guilty. Okay? They always have been found guilty, whether they did it or not. You know, and that just the research that we done, shout out to my girl Tamara Smith, Tamara Jones. Tamara Jones, because she did the research on it. She was our minister of justice at the time. Um, we went to, to, to see about Miss Pam. But when I left Tulsa, Oklahoma, and when I got out the car in Tulsa, and I'm telling y'all this with such compassion and empathy, when I stepped my foot on Tulsa ground, I heard the voice say, can these dry bones live? Can they live? Don't forget about the atrocities that happened to the people there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it's still happening today. 
Pamela Smith was raped and abused. Her story changed my life completely. I was not on the right path. I wasn't living right. I wasn't feeling right. And I was ready to die. I'm tell you that right now. I was a motorcycle ride idiot. Okay. I'm a, I, I rode with outlaw motorcycles. Okay. I just didn't care if I lived or died at the time. And that's just the truth. You know, people are like, why you say that? Because you need to understand where people were in their life. Her life changed my life. It made me realize that while I'm out here being reckless, this woman was just trying to go say goodbye to her sister. You understand? And she just did what she had to do and bared all the, the weight of that pressure and pain and misery this man tried to place on her life. Tried to. But this is a queen. And she deserved to be wearing that crown every single day of her life because she's a beautiful soul. She did not let that incident stop her from taking care of herself. It did stop her from taking care of everybody. She takes care of me. She had to tell me to shut up, just take it. And I'd be like, mama, I don't need nothing. You know what I'm saying? So she's like the God, the fairy godmother that we always wanted, but her story has got to be told. We have got to get justice for Queen Mother Pamela Smith. We have got to do what we got to do. And I made it my life mission. Even though we had a little moment of separation because things had transpired, again, we were infiltrated. I was infiltrated in the New Black Panther Party. I can speak on them. They sent money to people. People got paid to keep us away from Pamela Smith. Okay, I'm not going to speak ill on them. I'm just going to tell them some people cashed in to keep us away from that. Okay. That's how it always I left a man out. in, uh, I, okay, the first trip, and this is what people, do, like, again, they don't know the whole story, do they, Queen Mother? They don't know the whole story. They shut the, the courthouse down behind Queen Mother Pamela Smith when we were there. They lost documents. They we we showed up. They shut the whole daggone uh what was that the where we was at the court building? Shut the whole court building down. I had to leave this man in Ohio somewhere because he deliberately tore the car up. Okay. He tore up a Mercedes beans deliberately. We had to stay overnight in Ohio somewhere and then a, a hit. Uh, KKK town in the car, scared to get a room, scared to get out the car, scared to do let anybody know who we was for real. Just trying to get to Tulsa, Oklahoma, 19 hours from Washington, D.C. Driving, and I was the driver, okay? When I get behind the wheel of that car, if you ain't ready to go, you getting left because we got to go. You know what I'm saying? So, long story short. It's funny you say that because yeah. Speaking with Queen Mother earlier today, um, she talked about, you know, that energy still alive and well in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yes. So she invited Thorough Black Talk to come down there. So hopefully we'll make it down to, th uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I didn't want to cut you off, but I just mm -hmm. wanted to connect that. Yes, because people need to hear that. When we went to the um, the 100-year commencement of Tulsa, Oklahoma rides and stuff, Honey, you got to take your shoes off. You got to ground yourself when you get out there. It's overwhelming. As an empath, I could feel our ancestors saying, can these dry bones live? You understand what I'm saying? I heard this. It's not a go. It's not a game. So what I have done, and just to try to speed up where we at now, um, we had the Sankofa International Conference last uh, Saturday on April the 6th here in Washington, D.C. And my gift was to invite the royal family from all over Africa, Ghana, the Queen Mambakazi from Zimbabwe and South Africa. She's a dual queen king, just like General Nzinga, Queen Nzinga. We had her flown over. We had two other sisters, Queen Adelaide from Cameroon, and Queen Hamida from Tanzania. 
to come and crown Queen Mother Pam Smith an official queen on this land because only a queen can call another queen. Only a king can crown another queen. You know, and I wanted to pay homage to Queen Mother Pamela Smith and her fight for justice. She has been fighting. She has been begging. And she's done it with such grace. Look how beautiful she was. She was the most beautiful woman in the room. And such a flower. And she she helped me bloom and blossom into the woman that I have become. You know, I lost my mother when I was 34 years old. My mom died at 54 from lung cancer. So Miss Pam has been a mentor to me. She has been a, a guiding light that, you know, you can go through these things in life. You can make bad decisions, and but you don't deserve to be raped and abused by nobody. She made me really see my worth as a woman, you know, and standing in my truth. And then she know I, you know, I, I get emotional too, but I have heard her story so much that I had to live it. You understand? I had to pay. Um, I had to say, look, you heard this story. Now, what are you going to do? How are you going to change your life? How are you going to be an example for what you heard and what you saw and what you felt? Can these dry bones live? Because I saw myself as a dry bone, you know? I saw God speaking to me through this woman. I saw the things that, that needed to be done in this country. Black girls need to see that just because you was raped and abused, you can still be a beautiful queen. You can still be a royal princess. Look how beautiful she is. That is Queen Mambakazi of Zimbabwe. That is a real queen. This woman don't cast no shadow. You understand what I'm saying? She is pure love and spirit walking. And she came to crown Queen Mother Pamela Smith as the queen on this land. And King Nene Teche named her Queen Nene Dede Okanzi. He gave her that name. And that's her African name. And she is to be referred to and respected and bowed at as a real queen because she is. She's a real queen. She's a living doll. And I love her so very much. And she knows that I support her. And I, I will go to the end of the earth with her to get this justice. If it's just me and her out there fighting, we're going to fight together back to back. Ain't that right, Queen Mother? That's right, Jenna. That's right. Don't I know cry. that's right. And and I can concur. Um, in speaking with her on the telephone, you just feel that energy and around you, mm -hmm. just hearing her story and just you know, giving insight as how we should move um in this country and never be afraid to continue to fight. I know mm -hmm. sometimes the movement can get rough. Yes, um, it can get it can be a lot, especially when you are infiltrated. I definitely know what that is. Baby, you, you don't no, you don't know the ends that these people will go through to start. And I was like, not me. I'm thinking I'm not doing nothing but feed people. You know what I'm saying? You don't ever expect the that, uh, uh, uh that's enough to come you know to your house because you are uh you want to help people, you know what I'm saying. But they don't want us to unite. They don't want us to unite globally. They don't want us to unite our neighborhoods. They don't want to use, you know, but they cannot stop us. The only thing stopping us is us. Absolutely. You say that again, General. Yes. That's you the say only that thing stopping us is us. All we got to do is just stop listening to the bullshit. Excuse me. I'm sorry. But you know what I'm saying? We just got to stop the BS and really step up and advocate for what's right. We we were, oh, we are old in debt. And I'm excited today because I've been on Ancestry.com. I have the name of our enslaver, okay? I know his name. So they're going to give me my reparations. I ain't going to sit there and wait on the, them to give me nothing. I'm going to take it. And that's what we're doing around the globe. We are taking our reparations. We are taking our land back. We are taking our 
rightful place in this on this land. We ain't got to go back to Africa to have no land. This belongs to us because we was here first. We was here first. Come on, sis. Come on. Now, you better talk Come back on. to me. You know what I'm saying? So that's why we did this. And Queen Mother Pam didn't even know we was going to have this ceremony like that. It was shocking it was it was it was emotional i i couldn't even stop crying because it's i know what the holy spirit said to me young people that are your listening audience listen to your ancestors that's not you going crazy that is your people guiding you and telling you what you need to do and how you can honor them and how you can save your own life you know, if it had not been for Pamela Smith's story, I would have been a dead. I've been dead right now. I promise you, I would. And I don't even tell her that much because I don't want to worry her. But I would. I was not on the right path. I was not living a righteous life. But when I heard her story, it changed my life. It changed my outlook on what I need to do, and I need to get serious about my activism i need to get serious about my relationships with people i had to get serious about really not making promises that i cannot fulfill for our people and i told her then back then i said queen mother i'm gonna do whatever i can do to make sure the whole world know your story yes. you know Yes, she did. And I told her that. I said, we're going to get you your justice. It might not be tomorrow, might not be next week, but we're going to get you your justice. You're going to see and reap the benefits of what these people have done to you. Because this was a group effort, y'all. White folks stick together and they wrongness. And this Absolutely. is anything else you need to know. They stick together in their wrongness. They know they wrong. If it was their mother or their sister or their daughter, they would still stick together just to make a black man suffer or a black woman suffer. We can't go against this white man for this black lady. You understand what I'm saying? She wanted it. They Like she said, they vilify her. How you going to vilify the victim? How you going to make the victim, the, the you know, I ain't gonna take up y'all show. No, but it's quite easy, General, to vilify yeah. the victim because they know that the community doesn't support the victim. So yeah. as a victim, you go and you talk to your community. Oh yeah, oh, oh, oh. And because we are so miseducated mm -hmm. that when a victim comes and talks to someone, they victimize the victim, and so the victim feels alone. Mm -hmm. So I completely understand how it's difficult for us to set, tell our stories out loud mm -hmm. and pursue justice for our story. So again, I'm here. Utilize me. I'm here. <laughs> Good. Well, we trying to go to uh, Angola because uh, Queen Mother is going to be accompanying me at my coronation. I'm going to be uh Given us, I don't know if I'm gonna be crowned. I don't know what they're gonna do, but I've been uh, invited to come to Angola in July for to um, to receive Queen Nzinga as officially my name from the people of of Angola. Okay, they have officially given me that name, and I'm supposed to uh, to be there in July, and she's gonna accompany me because only queens can travel with queens. So I got to take my queen with me. <laughs> you know, got to take her with me. So, um, you know, we, we were fundraising. If you want to help out, uh, if, if it's all right with Sister Keisha, I'll send her my uh, my cash out. And Queen Mother, if you want to, you know, we, we really need help and support getting over there and just making her story globally. Because this is this Queen Mother Pamela Smith's all over the world. And, uh, and with the Million Woman World March, that I am the, the DC organizer for the Million Woman World March in Universal Movement as well. And um, we, we're going to be traveling to Ghana next year with the Million Woman World March. So 
it's opportunities to travel it's opportunities to have ambassadorship for different countries and just so much that we need to bring awareness is we're addressing the needs of women of color you know and what's happening to us all over the world so um i want to find out more information if i could queen mother about the my turning point program and work and, mm -hmm. and workshop what's that about okay uh, that's a program that me and my brother uh created uh it's a 13-week program where i heard i help women to deal with their uh addiction, uh, mm -hmm. they broken promises, uh, circle of pain, uh, what it's like to uh, do time and your family's affected by the time that they do, how you locked up, but your family's locked up right along with you. Mm -hmm. uh, my turning point uh, teaches the girls to be able to mend the fences and to uh, be able to reunite uh, back in society and become a, a, a a, a mother that they lost the opportunity to uh, be able to be the mother to their children. My turning point program has, uh, it helps uh, mothers, children with. I think she we try to, we, we try to, who for, I'm, I'm still going. Okay. Yeah, we hear you clearly, go ahead. We help uh, bury mothers when they die in prison. Uh, we work with funeral homes to be able to uh, help bury these young ladies. Uh, we also uh, make sure that we help them with uh, jobs and uh, teach these women how to cook, how to sew. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a foundation called Pamela Smith Foundation where uh, on every day of the week, if ladies need clothing, we give them changes of clothing and shoes. Uh, I just do whatever I can to be able to help these women so their lives will be just a little bit easier to be able to uh, stop these women from returning back to prison because uh, I know so many of them come out of prison and they have nothing. And so uh, when I walked out of prison, I thank God I had a family. And I had a support system and so many of those women do not have that. And when they come out, they return back to their crimes. And I just ask God to just bless me with a vision to be able to help these women with so many things. I help them with bus passes. And when I say help, I never, I never, I never ever did a grant. My husband was a military man. And I just felt like that God would bless me to be able to continue to help these women. And uh, so... I, I I took care of my foundation through my husband's money that he had received out the military. He saw my vision and he wanted to help me. And I still stand today. I've been uh, a nonprofit organization, the Pamela Smith Foundation since 2011. But I've been doing this work, uh, working with women uh, coming out of prison since 2004. And so every day of my life, I get up to try to help a woman that's been that's incarcerated. And this weekend, I will be doing uh, uniforms to give the mothers to help their children along the way. And also the mothers will give them clothing and shoes, purses, and whatever they need this week, this weekend, I will try to meet their needs as much, best as I can. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's my what's um, yeah. Definitely. Got to encourage that. Um, for those of you who want more information or how you can donate, um, it's right there on the screen for you. The Pamela Smith Foundation, 918-856-8319. That's 918-856-8319. And it's also dropped in the chat. Um, we have come to the end of our program. Mm -hmm. But um, again, we want to thank you for coming in and telling this story. Here on Thorough Black Talk, we make it our mission to tell our truth the way we tell it. As uh, Brother Tad always says, you know, we tell it, we, we, we do it how we do it. Because nobody can do it the way that we can. Nobody can articulate our story the way that we can. So when I see all of these fakers who come around 
as Sister Pamela Smith said, with the Democratic Party um, cape on their back, using mm -hmm. our pain for their gain, mm -hmm. using our pain for their gain. All of these black faces and high places have always been problematic for us. Black faces and high places in this political party has always been a problem with us. Always mm -hmm. since the Democratic Party's inception. It was this particular party that sanctioned the enslavement of black people in this country. It's this particular party that have sanctioned the abuse that continues to go on in this country. Um, there is a documentary on YouTube. I'll drop the link in the chat where you guys can see that um, Queen Mother Pamela Smith is not the only one going through this. There's a story of three black women um, who face similar circumstances um, in the penal system, even as far as the juvenile system um, is concerned. So you guys can check that out at your leisure, excuse me, at your leisure. Um, and connect the dots, connect the dots, connect the dots is very, very important. Again, you can get the book. Um, we had it up on the screen for you guys. Pamela, excuse me, the true story of Pamela Smith begging for justice. The true story of Pamela Smith begging for justice, the silent coalition. Um, you can get that too at 918-282-7057, 918-282-7057 for the book. Please follow Queen Mother Pamela Smith on Facebook. She drops a lot of information and details that you all need to know. So when these petitions come around or when she gives the clarion call that she needs us to speak up for her, you can say that you are well aware. You can say that you are well aware uh, Brother Black, your final thoughts and comments as it relates to uh, Queen Mother Pamela Smith. Uh, yes, yeah, sis. Um, thank you for your perseverance um, and and uh, for sticking it out this long, 28 years. That's a long time. A lot of people, Tupac didn't live 28 years and he left quite an impact. So never underestimate the uh, time of uh, your struggle and how you will persevere with your um, persevering um, personality. Um, Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would cover your story in my on my blog, but they took it from me because uh, the panel uh, is well aware of uh, the blog that I used to write, and you know because I'm coming too real, they took it from me. I will start a new one, and I will include your story with your permission, eventually me and sister Keisha and the panel's all in touch. So um, before I put anything out of what have you, I will ask your permission and let you know what it is so that you you can approve of it or disprove or what have you. Um, well, as far, I'd like to say right now, Okay. You, you have my permission now to do it. You don't have to wait to do it. You go ahead and appreciate that. Okay, you go ahead you. and do whatever you Okay, so I'm gonna. I want to say, uh -huh. I want to say, I don't know who the gentleman was that gave me a, a donation last time. I want to say thank you, whoever that was. That uh, was uh, Brother think. Magnetic Tyson. That was Brother Magnetic Tyson. Tell him thank you for me. Did you read what he just saying right now, Keisha, to the to the panel? He says, "I'm feeling the pain. Thank you for bringing your story to us so that we can." Fire up on getting justice. Absolutely. Right. So as far as that's concerned, um, I'm, I'm going to get that started sometime next week. Uh, I, I know we over time already, so I'm going to uh, uh, abbreviate my little uh, ditty. Love and respect each other. We see y'all here next week on the Baltimore Bridge. I mean, um, Brooklyn Bridge. Peace. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sister Marcia, your final thoughts and commentary on uh, this story with uh, Queen Mother Pamela Smith and this photograph that you uh, requested that we share. Um, so I just quickly came up with this because wow. of the words that you said, us first, right? Forget about the Me Too movement and all of these things. We truly need to put us first. We continually talk about race first and this and that. Somewhere along the lines, we must really consider 
what does race first means, what does it look like, and what does us first looks like. These are just the snapshots of women that we've discussed today that have been assaulted by, again, the system that's supposed to protect us, the system that's supposed to, the system that we all say, oh my God, the system is so great. And like the woman, um, I don't remember her name, but she said um, in one of these posts that black faces in high places are not going to save us. It is us that's going to save ourselves. We can't tag along into everyone's movement. We don't need to be in high places. Let us be small, but let us be small, powerful, and actionable. Brothers and sisters, it is so hard out here, right? There is a struggle. But there is the ability for us to thrive if we work together. That's the only way that this is going to happen. Let's put everything aside. We've seen even in the Garvey movement, we see how they infiltrate the movement and get people to go against someone who has a vision for our people. We need to be stronger in our mathematics of self. We need to be stronger in our knowledge. And we need to continue to support Queen Mother Pam, General Nzinga, Sister Keisha, Brother Tab, Brother Black, myself, anyone who has a story to tell, for us to tell our story with strength and glory because our ancestors are for us. We have a million ancestors behind us. There's no way we can't be victorious. Brother Tad, and thank you, Third Black Talk, for another powerful evening. Brother thank Tad. You. Yeah. First, I want to say thank you, Queen Mother Pam. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you. Thank me you. hearing stories like this has always been difficult for me. It's not something I support or condone. It's, it's just painful for me. Um, I'm quite sure other brothers uh, share my sentiments of hearing stories of, of our sisters and queens being abused. You know, it's painful. And congratulations on your coronation on being recognized as a queen in a continent. Thank you. And congratulations you, to our sister, General Nzinga. Prayerfully, once you get to Angola, you'll be recognized as the same for the work that we do. I've been to Africa several times, and of course, you know, they're waiting on us. They're waiting on us to come home, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, y'all hit on a very important point that we always try to drive home here. And I'm glad that we're definitely in alignment. I like to talk about infiltration because mm -hmm. that's the only thing that really hinders us. It's not the commitment. It's not the ethic. It's not that we're trying. It's that people on the inside are sabotaging mm -hmm. our efforts just to move us forward and get what we deserve. And until we deal with these people, we're going to be like a dog running its tail. A lot of times, you know, people got their favorite orators and favorite movie producers, but these people are misdirecting us. Mm -hmm. You know, even as, as Mother Pam said, you know, you go to the Congressional Black Caucus and, and they're dragging their feet and getting justice. So mm -hmm. what are we doing? But the power is in our hands. So I just want to say thank you to y'all for your commitment, your effort, and just for being in alignment what we represent here on Thorough Black Talk. Sister Marcia, Sister mm -hmm. Keisha, Brother Blacksmith, my brother Ashe, who's not here, we're all in alignment. And that's by divine design, that alone. So to the audience out there, just we want to thank y'all for tuning in. Hopefully you inspired by something you heard tonight. It's your turn to go out and inspire others. So y'all stay up, stay blessed, stay true. And remember, no matter how hard things may seem right now, there's always better days ahead. Sister Keisha. Again, family, we definitely, definitely appreciate you guys for coming in and joining us and hearing this story. Please like and subscribe. Make sure you share this story on your social media platform. We have to keep the conversation alive. If you know independent Black media outlets, please give them Sister P Queen Mother Pamela Smith's information, mm -hmm. and we can get her on those platforms as well. Um, so YouTube, don't be starting with me. Because the queen mother herself said we have permission to continue to share this story. Do not strike my channel with the foolishness. We have permission. Um, queen Nzinga, General Nzinga, keep doing your work. Um, it's not by happenstance that the ancestors called you. 
to do this work. Sometimes, as you said, we don't like to listen and we don't like to hear. But once we do, we understand our purpose in life and we continue the mission forward. So as my brother Ashe would always say, <laughs> keep your left foot forward. True courage is knowing how to stop it. The battlefield is where you stand. We're going to close out tonight with a clip of Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Dr. Yosef Binyakana, and Dr. John Henry Clark. Good night, y'all. We'll see y'all black again next Thursday. Good night. I, I hear tell that, um, that ships that set sail had to be blessed. Is that so? And that that went uh, as well for slave ships? Practically every slave ship that left the ports of Europe was blessed by either a Roman Catholic priest or a Protestant mm -hmm. minister. And even the monstrosity of it all can be seen in the East Coast Africa, where in Mombasa, one of the slave forts is called Fort Jesus. We all know about the ship, the good ship Jesus, that was one of the slavers making its way around the coast and across to the New World with our people captive in its hold. How is it conceived? How do a people can come upon the idea of enslaving another people? I agree. It, the enslavement doesn't come because you hate the people. You want their land. You want their natural resources. And in order to, to take them and control them, you must enslave them.